Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the session uh, of Wednesday of Ecological Systems. Uh, today we have uh, really, really nice speakers as the other days. And uh, I give the word to Frederic Bartumeus that will be the chair in the morning session. So Frederic, um, thanks for accepting, for uh, coordinating the morning session and you can start whenever you want. Okay, hello everybody. Today the topic is on, on ecological systems uh, and I'm glad to introduce the first speaker uh, who is uh, Daniel Oro. Uh, Daniel uh, started uh, at the, got a position at the Spanish Research Council in 2000, uh, like 21 years ago, at, uh, at Mallorca, at IMEDEA. And there he launched uh, uh, a research group on animal demography and population dynamics, uh, and also uh, interested in, in topics on, of evolution, animal evolution, and, and also applied uh, biological conservation. So he then came uh, in 2016 to, to the inland, to Catalonia, and, and uh, joined the Theoretical and Computational Ecology Group uh, at the Center for Advanced Studies of Blanes. And he recently has been more and more interested in, in behavioral processes and, and, and movement processes as well, uh, and trying to relate these components with, with all what he knew and learned uh, through all these years on on population demography and dynamics. So, Daniel, uh, your your turn. You can start whenever. You can share the screen, and you have about 45, 50 minutes. And let's see whether we can have ten minutes for for questions. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. My, my screen. Okay. Thank you, Josep. Thank you, Fede. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I first, I would like to thank the, the organizers for, for having me here today. Um, and my talk is, is uh, deals with, uh, with social behavior in social animals and, and the consequences of, of uh, some of this uh, social behavior for uh, their population dynamics. Uh, some, some of the issues I will deal with uh, uh, are related uh, to a book I recently published about uh, social processes, uh, behavioral feedbacks, and, and the consequences of these feedbacks for nonlinear population dynamics. Um, okay, uh, what was the inspiration for this uh, for this topic? Um, a few years ago, I visited uh, once again a, a very special place uh, in the in the Costa Brava in, in the North, North Catalonia, uh, near to the French border. This is Ampurias, and Ampurias is an ancient uh, Greek colony um, um, in the Gulf of, of Roses, uh, near the French border, as I say. And the place is is a very idyllic site. It was founded. Uh, in the sixth uh, century before uh, the present era by Greek colonists, and then later was occupied by, by the Romans. Uh, but in the Middle uh, Ages, in the early Middle Ages, well, it was exposed uh, um, to uh, marauders like Vikings, Arabs, and, and Normandy pirates. And, and just, just suddenly the, the town was abandoned. And then uh, Ampurias began to decline, and, and apparently this coincided in time with the power, uh, with the increase in power of, of two other coastal sites. One was Tarraco, the, the actual Tarragona, and the other was, was Barcino, the actual Barcelona. And, and I, I always wondered why such a place uh, with, with, with you know, these big uh, protective walls these, these temples and these, these rich mosaics and, and, the, and the big uh, uh, breakwater to, to allow uh, boats uh, to, to trade uh, with the city. Why this uh, such extremely rich place was abandoned in, in, a, in a short period of time. And we, if, if we figure out what was the curve of population density over time in this place, we may uh, visualize something like this, so something like a kind of uh, 
uh, phase of growth, then a kind of uh, um, flourishing phase with higher, uh, highest uh, population density, and then a, a sharp decline to extinction or quasi extinction. Okay, uh, the figure I just showed uh, is right the population density of the city of Rome over 15 centuries. Since the uh, rise of the empire, uh, this, this uh, um, uh, flourishing and relatively short period of, of flourishing uh, time when, when Rome was the capital of empire, and then uh, the appearance of uh, perturbation, okay? Uh, for instance, the appearance of competitors, the appearance of um, uh, the, the appearance of internal turmoil, so uh, kind of, of um, social social uh, troubles, and then the appearance also of uh, let's say a, a, be a better patch when the emperor Constantino moved the capital of the empire to the actual city of Istanbul. Okay, and then a sharp decline. Uh, um, to a state, as I said, of, of quasi-extinction. And, and these this, uh, processes may mimic very well what I observed in, in nature for some animal and plant populations, especially, well, in, in this case, for animal populations of, of social organisms. And this is uh, the second inspiration of, of, my, of the topic I deal with today. And, and is, a, is a figure of, of population density of uh, um, uh, social uh, girls that colonized a very suitable patch in the early 80s. And then uh, we can observe this uh, kind of uh, exponential uh, uh, growth phase until the patch hold up to more than 70% of total world population. And then there was again, uh, like the case of the city of Rome, the appearance of a perturbation, in this case, in the form of the arrival of predators, uh, carnivores that arrived at the patch, and this generated emigration to other patches, most of them new colonizations, and then the population entered this phase of sharp decline uh, down to uh, a patch containing only, holding only 3% of total world population. And I will be back to this uh, real example of, uh, of a social animal later on. Okay, uh, what about um, uh, sociality in the frame of evolution? Okay, social uh, sociality may have, of course, many uh, and several advantages. For instance, uh, it allows organisms uh, to have a more efficiency in securing food, conservation of body heat, increase of habitat suitability, mating facilitation, improved detection and defense against predators, decreased mortality of the young, uh, greater life expectancy, division of labor and specialization of activities. But of course, as usual, um, sociality has also cost. Uh, there is increased competition, there is faster depletion of resources, there is greater attraction of enemies, and there is a faster spread of parasites and diseases. Um, okay, I mentioned some um, uh, behavioral processes that are particular to social animal. And I'm not dealing here with uh, cooperation, but uh, uh, rather a very uh, simple uh, behavioral processes, which is social coping and all the behavioral syndromes that are associated with this uh, simple social coping. I I'm going to show you a very short video about what social coping, uh, which is also called, called uh, conformity for, for humans, okay? And I hope you will see what the speaker is going to, to tell about the video. To answer that question, we set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone, simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this, or would you? After 
just three beats and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. Okay, uh, this is an experiment set for humans and how social coping is, is a extremely simple but very powerful uh, behavioral processes that uh, all social organisms use uh, very naturally. And, and that's another example is, is when we have to decide where to have a coffee and we, we face two terraces and we, we see one uh, crowd of people and the other one is empty and our trend is to to have a coffee exactly at the left uh, bar terrace here in the image where, where uh, everybody is sitting there. So this is going to affect uh, decision making with fitness consequences. Fitness, I, I mean, uh, traits that have consequences for, for fitness, for evolutionary efficacy, dispersal, uh, survival and fertility. And this is going to affect, of course, uh, uh, processes like uh, population dynamics, metapopulation dynamics, when we include uh, dispersal, uh, network dynamics, food web dynamics, and, and predator-prey dynamics. Okay, let, let's, uh, uh, let's um, uh, talk a little bit about a couple of examples of, of this uh, conformity. One uh, is, a, is a paper published by Etienne Danchen and co-authors. Uh, they found that the social coping not, occurs in very simple organisms, in this case, uh, fruit flies, beyond social mammals and birds. Uh, they found that fruit flies um, uh, um, have cognitive capacity that enable them to transmit uh, mating preferences culturally across generations, potentially persistent traditions uh, in mating preference, and, and these traditions are, are the main marker of, of cultures. Uh, besides, uh, social organisms may also share social information. For instance, this paper by Flag and co-authors found that flying trajectories of migrat migrating uh, storks over challenging uh, ocean straits show that some storks simply follow the exact trajectories of birds with higher experience uh, who lead the group or who lead the migration uh, group. Okay, so these this, uh, behavioral processes uh, uh, may alter, as I said before, predator-prey dynamics in systems where uh, at least uh, one of the agents of, of a predator-prey system is social, or, or the two are social, like the ones I show here. So, uh, you know, sardines and dolphins, zebras and wild dogs, bees and bee eaters, and um, mammoths and Neanderthals. These are just some examples. Let, let's uh, explore um, these, these predator-prey dynamics in social systems. Uh, we all know uh, the Lotka and Volterra uh, model of, of this, this uh, pair of first order nonlinear differential uh, equations in which N represents uh, the number of prey, in this case, in this case, sardines, and P is the number of predators, in this case, are hakes. Um, and is exactly the study case that uh, the son-in-law of, of uh, Vito Volterra showed to him to inspire uh, his models. And, and um, John Frixell and co-authors modify this, this standard predator-prey model to incorporate social interactions in the two agents, in the predator and the prey. This, this uh, theta logistic uh, model for prey is modified to include a functional response, this functional response here, C of uh, N, which is the number of prey, and the predator group size, which is uh, represented by this G. Uh, R max uh, is the maximum per capita rate of change of prey, and this uh, epsilon here um, is the maximum per capita rate of change of prey. I'm sorry, epsilon is a coefficient converting uh, consumed prey into new predator recruits, and, and D is a mortality rate for predators, this D here. Okay, if we develop the functional responses here, um, we start from a, from a type two holding functional response, C of N, which is prey intake uh, per predator per day. H1 is the expected time to attack and kill each uh, prey item. Each, uh, H2 is the expected time to consume and digest 
each prey item, and n is its prey density per surface per surface unit. And then uh, we can evaluate the effect of prey forming uh, social groups by inserting a modified encounter rate, this uh, ACN to the exponential of B, where C is the intercept and B is the slope of the linear regression of uh, prey group size versus uh, prey density. And then uh, predators forming uh, social groups social entities would change the handling time of prey leading to the functional response C of uh, N and G. Uh, remember that this uh, G is predator group size. And of course, this is going to reduce as long as uh, the uh, uh, size of the group of predators, this is going to reduce the handling time. And finally, we can combine the last two functional responses, these two. Um, to assess the consequences of prey and predators forming social groups. So this, this final functional response is where is when two, the two, the, the prey and the predators form social groups. And, and some results um, of these uh, four options are shown here by, by this figure. This figure shows the stable and unstable states depending on conversion efficiency, conversion efficiency here a mortality rate here. The A panel is when the two, uh, the predator and the prey, <clears throat> are not social. B is when only the social, uh, sorry, the predator are social. C is when only the prey is social. And D represents when the two, the predator and the prey are social. And we see that the unstable state decreases as long as the two agents uh, became became uh, social. This shows that uh, this that the system uh, increases stability as long as uh, the prey and the predator uh, form groups. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> let's go back to to decision making and to explore how perturbation may influence this process of decision making. This has been uh, studied by. Um, by two colleagues, Alfonso Pérez Escudero and Gonzalo Polavieja, using, using Bayesian rules. Um, first, an individual has to decide uh, to use uh, two, two types of information. One is private, so the information that the individual is able to gather over time, and the other is social information. So uh, social information, uh, what, what others are going to decide to make an estimate of the environment and make this type of decision. For instance, the decision, this decision implies to disperse to two different patches, patch uh, X and patch Y. And, and this is exactly uh, what occurs in human population. For instance, during, during civil wars, in which people have to decide when to leave the patch where they live and where to go, especially where to go. Okay, So we estimate the probability of choosing the, the patch Y, having social information B, <clears throat> and private information C. So Y is uh, Y is the patch, uh, the probability that patch Y is a good option, and and uh, patch O patch Y is a bad option. Okay, and and, uh, and using uh, the individual has to use or may use uh, two type of information. Two type of information. One is social, and expressed by B, and and private information expressed by by C. And this GY is the probability that option Y is good, estimated using only private information. Remember this C here. And, and these two probabilities are the probabilities of deciding uh, only using social information. And then we assume that GY becomes less, <clears throat> less relevant under perturbation. So G tends to zero. And using these rules, we can develop these patient rules and we end up um, with the first result. And, and the, the result using Bayesian decision making predicts a preference for the majority option under perturbation. That means that when perturbation increases, the probability of using uh, social information increases. So I'm going to copy what others do uh, when there is a perturbation uh, and, and there is a 
let's say, a, a danger of, of decreasing my, my fitness in terms of evolution, okay? Uh, nevertheless, uh, we are still missing uh, a mechanism of the origin of the preference uh, for the majority option, okay? For the preference for using uh, social information. And the decision pro process can be split in, in two steps. Uh, the first is the decision of the quality of the patches, QX and QY, uh, made once again using social information, so on what others uh, decide, and private information. And when using social information, we, we, we have a final estimate of the quality of the patch that is different, okay, um, and not using the starting estimation of equal, equal quality for X and Y patches which is represented by the, this uh, dashed line here, okay? So after estimating the quality of the patch, then the individual uh, has to choose a certain option, option Y or option uh, X. And um, we can represent here the probability of choosing the, uh, uh, the, the patch Y um, uh, uh, in terms of the relative quality of, uh, of patch Y um, for the system of two patches, okay? So the blue diamond again shows uh, the final estimate of the quality of the two patches. And the probability of choosing Y is moving to the more wide ISO clients here uh, of choosing uh, a Y, okay? Uh, we, then, uh, we then can calculate the probability of using social information. Um, and these are the uh, trajectories followed by the estimate qualities on the perturbation. So the arrowheads here, the blue arrowheads, point towards a stronger perturbation for three different decision tools. Up here is the, the relative quality of, of patch Y. Uh, uh, in the middle is, the, is an absolute, using an absolute decision rule, so not taking into account the ratio between the two qualities. And here in the bottom is a deterministic decision rule. So I will choose uh, patch Y um, when, when the quality of patch Y is, is uh, larger than the quality of patch uh, X. And, and finally, we, we, can, uh, we estimate the probabilities to use uh, social information as a function of the privately uh, estimated quality G uh, using these three decision rules. So uh, above is the change in estimated quality leads to a different probability of dispersing to each patch. In the middle and bottom panels, estimated, estimated quality, uh, quality wrong along an ISO probability line of the decision rule, which is unlikely in the real world, except for decision rules with large regions of constant probability, as for example, the deterministic rule always choose the option with highest estimated probability. Okay, why, uh, why animals estimate a patch quality? Well, they, they have to gather information and they gather information by a, a process called prospecting. And, and in this figure, we see the trajectories. I, I hope you see the trajectories here uh, of two uh, seagulls breathing in a coastal patch shown here by the, by the red uh, star and going straight to feed uh, on open sea exactly where uh, fish density is high, represented here in the inner panel. So um, once they have obtained food, birds do not return straight to the colony following what we would call an optimal trajectory but instead they visit patches along the coastline shown by, by this uh, red dot here or empty patches uh, showed, shown by this uh, white dot here. We know that girls stop in these patches and not in others and that they spend time here, especially at the empty patches. Most of the empty patches where girls stop and spend more time, uh, we know that are colonized in later years. Remember the, the picture I showed uh, before on bar terraces, we know that birds tend to disperse to patches where social information and clues for estimating patch quality are available. For instance, the number of conspecifics or heterospecifics uh, or the number of chicks, so which is a, a proxy of, of, of uh, fertility. And these are all evidences of resources being available. 
of course, we can also sit down in an empty terrace, but then we will have to order a sandwich and a beer to estimate uh, the quality of the bar using only our private information. Okay, um, uh, going back to the effects of perturbations on, on, um, on, the, on population dynamics, uh, I, I mentioned before civil wars. So, so what I did was to explore data from Africa about this issue. And this figure shows the, the percentage of the population enrolled as refugees ranging uh, in each panel from zero to 40% for a number of sub-Saharan uh, African countries suffering a civil war. Okay, uh, so it's Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Djibouti, Angola, Liberia, Mozambique, Rwanda, Congo, Burundi, Guinea-Bissau, and Sierra Leone. The y-axis is the relative quality of each of these patches, this, each of these countries, approximated uh, by, by GDP. And uh, the, the, the figure in, in the right is exactly the same one, but represented uh, as the relative patch quality, relative uh, meaning relative to the neighboring countries. And, and we, we can observe in the, in the right panel is that, sorry, the, the red stretches of, of each of the panel represent the, the number of, uh, of refugees during, during civil wars, okay? The, the red stretches represent exactly the years when the civil war occurred. And we can see those, these, those, these, these peaks in the number of, of uh, refugees. And, and the right panel shows that uh, the two cases in, in the bottom, these uh, cases in Cote d'Ivoire and where the number of refugees are extremely low. And these are exactly the two countries where um, uh, the neighboring uh, countries has no, no better GDP, meaning that in principle, the number of refugees is, is very low when the chances to move to a better patch are, are very low. Okay, uh, we have seen how decision making and, and uh, works and, and how it works, especially the influence, the, the large influence of perturbations, how individual uh, individuals use uh, social versus uh, private information, and uh, what is the importance of uh, heterogeneity in patch quality. Then I, I will explore how dispersal from a patch may occur in a population of, of a social species and how this may influence the local dynamics and the metapopulation dynamics due to social coping, okay? And, and I will explore this under the frame of critical transitions that, that Martin S. Heffer um, writes up, up, up in his book uh, about critical transitions in, in nature and society. And, and he inspired the, the subtitle of my book, When to Live and Where to Go. And the point is that you probably are very familiar with these uh, critical transitions when there is a perturbation that is uh, cumulative over time. And at some point there is a critical point where the system changes state uh, suddenly to a, a very different state. And we can uh, translate this into a system having uh, two states. One is the philopatric state, meaning that everybody stays at their home patch where information is available, where, where you know where resources are. So you are not going to leave this patch because dispersal is risky unless there is kind of a, a loss of a resilience due to an increase of perturbation over time. And then the system is moving to another state that we call a dispersal state where everybody is going to uh, disperse, okay, by suddenly. Uh, okay, we can also uh, then add this spatial dimension to or theoretically how metapopulation dynamics change depending on social versus no social dispersal. This is a study that I'm developing with uh, my colleague Ricardo Martinez Garcia, uh, who is now the South American Institute for Fundamental Research. And then we can imagine a population of field walls affected by a perturbation. And first individuals must decide about to stay or to disperse. 
Second, they have to decide whether to use only uh, private information or use social information instead. In the latter case, they would use social coping to follow the others to disperse to more suitable patches for increasing uh, fitness prospect. And uh, dispersal is known to affect meta population dynamics, but in social species uh, where social coping is common, dispersal may be nonlinear. And this nonlinearity may result from a behavioral dispersal avalanche due to social coping once a, a threshold value of perturbation is, is attained. So dispersal could be linear, but at some point over this threshold value, dispersal increases uh, exponentially and, and there is this kind of uh, avalanche that, it, that is uh, described for many different systems, biological and physical systems. Um, we built a logistic model adding a perturbation parameter, this uh, perturbation parameter P here, uh, that ranges between zero, so optimal environment con environmental conditions, and one, this is uh, P equal one, represents the harshest environment, so in an environment affected by a perturbation. The term uh, DPN uh, is a linear function of the mortality rate, and finally, we consider two mechanisms for individual dispersal. Uh, one is a, a non-social driver here, dispersal non-social, and this DS is the uh, social dispersal. Uh, individual disperse depending on the occupancy of the patch, and we therefore factorize the dispersal rate in non-social and a social contribution. Each of them weighted by a socially, uh, sociality parameter, P, this, uh, this term P is, is, is um, when P is zero, dispersal is purely non-social, uh, while, while it purely social for P equal one. And, and the, this social dispersal, of course, depends on, on population density. And in order to, to keep the calculations uh, very simple and try to obtain some analytical results, we use a function for social dispersal in which um, uh, S defines the population size at which the social dispersal rate decays to. And fixing the perturbation rate, we can explore how dispersal rate changes with population density. And so as long as, uh, as population density decreases, uh, dispersal rate increases uh, with different shapes depending on these, these P parameters that, remember, represents um, uh, the sociality parameter. So when sociality is zero, when the, the species is solitary, the dispersal rate is going to be constant in the, independently of, of population density. And when we explore the non-trivial uh, steady states of our model, depending on the dispersal strategy, we can compare how population density varies uh, uh, when population density here in the y-axis varies with dispersal rate depending on, on the perturbation uh, severity expressed by, by this uh, p-value from very low values here, 0 0.05 to very high values of perturbation. And, and we see that um, um, the, the, the figure suggests, um, well, in any case, when, when uh, this, this um, p-value represents the sociality, when, when p is zero, the species is, is, is solitary, when p is one, the species is, is very social. And taking the example, for instance, of, of, of here, uh, when, when p, um, uh, when perturbation is very low, we see anyway that when the species is social and, and dispersal rate increases at some point, population density decreases abruptly to a state of, of extinction, okay? So the, the, the point here is that when the species uh, is social, there is a critical transition of population density when dispersal rate increases. And the figure suggests the existence of, of an Ali effect and that in social species, there is a minimum critical size for a population to successfully colonize an empty patch. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, now we move uh, from theoretical models to fitting a model for for social coping uh, to real data. This is a study uh, made in collaboration with with Meritxell Genovart, 
from uh, Theap Fesik and Hastings from, from UC Davis and two members of the CRM, Josep Sardanyes and Luis Alcedá, who performed uh, the bulk of mathematical modeling. We go back to the example of social seagulls in a patch where the, these numbers over the line represent the, the percentage of uh, the percentage that this that this patch hold um, uh, in relation to total world population and the shaded area represents uh, the the period when um, when carnivores arrive at, at the patch and generated uh, a, a big perturbation, okay? At some point, managers were, were able to eradicate all these carnivores, but the populations uh, still decreased, holding only 3% of total world population. And uh, the main uh, factor for this sharp decline was, was dispersal. Uh, the, red, uh, the red star uh, here shows the patch, the patch uh, of, of this of this time series, and the, the green dots represents the new patches that were colonized after the after carnivores arrived after, at the patch. So after the perturbation initiated, and the inner panel here shows the the uh, the time series of population dynamics for the whole meta population, showing that uh, the meta population did not show. This, this sharp decline and, and confirming that the, the cause of this decline here was due to dispersal. So what we did was, was modeling this, this dispersal using again an, 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 a logistic model modified to include this uh, term here, the last term here with lambda being uh, a, a rate of dispersal D depending on population size, this X uh, of T and then uh, depending on these three parameters, mu, sigma, and delta, we can reformulate the logistic function, uh, putting together immigration, growth, and death rate here by this alpha term, and putting the nonlinear competition term, including this k, the carrying capacity here, and then uh, again uh, the dispersal uh, term uh, using uh, social using social social coping to uh, model how a dispersal influenced the dynamics of this population. And then uh, what we did was to use a, 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 an Elliott function uh, with parameters uh, mu, uh, sigma, and delta. Here we can see how this dispersal here in the y-axis varies with with a decreasing population density at patch and this dispersal uh, ranges from from constant dispersal this orange uh, uh, straight line here meaning that there is no social coping for dispersal when when population density decreases to different forms of, of dispersal this this black line for instance represents an exponential uh, increase of dispersal when when population decreases and these curves here in the middle represents some kind of nonlinear responses above a threshold value of population density. And results, uh, once we fit the best model using different uh, values of uh, these parameters for the Elliott function, uh, using artificial intelligence algorithms and, and the least squares uh, values for each function, uh, the final result shows that uh, this decreasing phase here is best fitted with a, with a model using an Elliott function, the, the ping one represented here in, in, the, in the left panel. And the potential uh, function uh, shows that the phase of collapse, uh, of course, tends to, to um, a state of extinction. And we can here uh, see all the dispersal types that fitted uh, much worse. One is uh, density independent dispersal here. In the middle, we have uh, exponential dispersal, which would be what we uh, we would expect uh, from a logistic model with negative uh, per capita growth rate, and and also and, and also the the, the worst fit of, of a twisted Elliott function, which resembles quite well uh, the exponential dispersal shown here in the middle panel. Uh, yeah. 
of course, this uh, this results uh, fits very well with with the uh, with the concept of of tipping point. Uh, we see here in this in this video. Um, uh, uh, so the, the how the system uh, reaches a tipping point by gradually uh, changing the the environmental conditions. Uh, you see that. Uh, the system at some point when, when uh, environmental conditions are uh, accumulating over time, at some point this uh, population is going to change abruptly its state and this uh, fits quite well with this idea of, of animals staying in the, in the natal uh, patch uh, when there is a perturbation until these perturbations uh, accumulate over time and at some point everybody is going to disperse uh, following what others do. And this, is, uh, this uh, fits very well with this idea of runaway dispersal. This is, the, this is the, really the concept of, of the tipping point, which, which was first uh, coined by, by this journalist, Malcolm Gladwell, in, in his book, The, the Tipping Point, and, and how little things can, can make a, a big difference. And, and he uses uh, um, several social examples, such as uh, fashion trends, changes in criminality rates, where small initial changes led to, to a runaway process, causing, causing big, big transitions. And if we recover our study system uh, on, on social goals, and we plot here the dispersive uh, response, uh, depending on, on a decreasing population size, which is expressed here by the by the phase of collapse of the population. We see three different phases: a slow phase of, of a very slow increase in in dispersal um, when population is decreasing, and then there is a, an accelerating phase uh, above a, a threshold of population density, and then the final uh, phase of uh, slowing down when uh, population density has its, its lower densities, okay? And uh, um, again, uh, this, is, this, this, this represents very well the nonlinear um, uh, trade-off between phylopatry and dispersal and, and their, their own momentum. The two, the two processes, phylopatry and dispersal, they have a, a strong momentum for for deciding uh, what the individuals are going to are going to make, um, for instance, a, a percolation model is 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 very useful to, to show exactly this type of process. Uh, the trend to stay when when the the percolation probability is very low. So red dots are individuals that stay, and and blue and blue dots here are an individual that disperse. And at some point, when when the probability of um, the initial fraction of dispersals from so individuals that are willing to disperse increases linearly. At some point, the, the percolation probability shows these this nonlinear changes, this nonlinear change, sorry, here. And, and this, this fits uh, very well with uh, with we observe uh, in, the, in the number of uh, asylum petitions uh, for, for the Syrian civil war since, since the the beginning of the of the Syrian civil war in 2011, and at some point there is an acceleration of, of uh, the number of Syrian petitions, and at the end there is a deceleration of, of the of this of this rate of, of petitions. And it's exactly what we observe. Uh, if we go back, uh, this represents quite well this this momentum this momentum of of. Uh, um, here we see the momentum for this accelerating, accelerating phase for dispersal, and at some point this represents this this, uh, this slowing down phase of dispersal when when population densities are very low, and these are expressed by this um, this uh, phases of of quasi extinctions. Um, uh, may, that may may last long periods of time. This is what we observe for the city of Rome uh, before numbers rise again, especially since the unification of, of small republics to form what uh, today is known as, as Italy. 
and this st uh, same state of, of uh, quasi extinction that represents this momentum for for uh, philopatry uh, is is also uh, observed in in wild animals. I, I show here four examples of this uh, quasi extinction states of of um, of two different species of colonial or so social uh, water birds. And I'm, I'm going to end my talk uh, with um, a reflection about, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that social systems uh, have their, their costs. Of course, social coping uh, is, a, is a universal phenomenon in social species, but this very simple behavior has also costs. And conformity may drive the majority to make uh, extremely bad decisions, like the one in this picture. But uh, the reflection is that th that does not mean that uh, all individuals follow the rule. And this is precisely one of the fascinating basics of, of evolution and selection. OK, thanks very much. The last slide. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, OK? Thank you. Thank you, Danny. So uh, I, sorry not to tell before, uh, but Giuseppe already did that. So you can send questions to the chat uh, as, uh, as, 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 as the, the, the talk progresses. Uh, but yeah, perhaps like, if you raise your hands or you can straight. Yeah, uh, straight forward if you have a question. Is, yeah. We have, yeah, about 10 minutes or, or so. I, I do have a question, if you want okay, to, further, break, go on. to break the ice. <laughs> um, um, so so, so this, uh, the choice of this Elliott function that you were showing yeah. uh, with these three parameters and so on and so forth, I mean, why, why is what, why you pick that function and, and whether there should be maybe a more simple function that could uh, more or less qualitatively pick the ideas that you were willing to explore? Well, the advantage of this function, um, as, as far as I understood, learning from my from mathematical teachers, is that uh, uh, playing with these three parameters, you can obtain very different shapes of uh, dispersal uh varying with with population density which is exactly what we are trying to find out is this mm -hmm. dispersal linear is this dispersal non-linear and if in if it's the later which type of non-linear dispersal fits better with what we observe in nature okay and exactly so that there is exactly showing that it, uh, that this responds to a to the, the the type of, of dispersal of tipping point using social coping, which is uh, represented by uh, this density the, dependent dependent process. The, the parameters don't have a special meaning in this case. No, no so it's just didn't... it's just they they define the shape of the function. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sonia, I saw I see that you you have the camera. Yeah. Yes. Hi. 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 Very nice talk, uh, Daniel. It's nice Thank to you. nice to see you and hear you virtually. Yeah. And uh, also, I'm very curious about your book. Now I want to order it and check it out. Um, so my question might not be very relevant. Um, it's just I have a hard time wrapping my mind. So you show that there's a lot of processes uh, that show nonlinearities and therefore contain all the ingredients for alternative stable states and tipping point. What is not completely clear to me is to what extent do you have evidence for alternative stable states at the population or even uh, community level in your data? No, I don't have data on, on, on community level, uh, but we can suspect that um, in communities formed by social species, this may have some effect on the community since uh, theoretical models show, you know, uh, being social may alter, for instance, predator-prey dynamics and then population dynamics of the prey and the predator and supposedly 
alter also the community dynamics. And of course, this dispersal issue is important because it is going to affect the spatial scale of, of, the, of the meta population and the meta community dynamics. This is an expectation, but I don't have any evidence. Yeah. I'm very limited to the fact that dispersal in social species is, is, a, is a runaway process in the sense that as long as you are in a bar and there is an, an, an alarm fire, you know, blurring, uh, at the beginning you stay, sit down, but as long as people is, is starting to run away, your, your chances to follow the majority increases. And this, this has consequences for the, let's population the population at the bar and the population of humans outside the bar. That's a, that's a very sim simple explanation. Yeah, but actually it's a, it's a very nice possible extension of the current theory, right? Uh, we don't really know the effects of these nonlinear mechanisms at, at a larger scale than the one of the patch. Yeah. Um, so I think you're like you you're giving ingredients to like really scale up the theory to mm. more complex systems. Yeah, that's that's the the first shot is is the one I showed is very preliminary, but of course there are many derivatives of including um, this social uh, factor in in uh, in meta population yeah. models and meta community models. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point, of course. Well, thanks again. Thank you, Sonia. So anybody else? Yeah, so I was trying to find how to raise my hand uh, here <laughs> in the Zoom, but I'm not able to find it. So anyway, so I, I would like to make some comments about uh, Fede's question. So the, the idea of using this function is, so the most important thing is that <clears throat> we were trying to see if uh, what we call um, inverse density dependent function, that is that the dispersal rate increases when the population at the patch diminishes. So contrary to the typical exponential term in which you assume that you have death or just uh, individuals that are, are leaving the patch. Mm -hmm. and, and the Elliott function uh, actually uh, can uh, contain the exponential let's say, but in, in a density independent, uh, inverse density independent way, and, and even the density, sorry, density dependent, and even the density independent mm -hmm. by playing with new delta and the other parameters, okay? So we also made the fit of the data uh, just using, uh, let's say, the uh, constant dispersal, that this means without any kind of interaction between individuals, and, and the exponential, okay, but assuming density, positive density, density dependence. So uh, this term uh, rho x. Uh, but what we did that uh, was necessary to give support to this kind of inverse density dependence, so that the less individuals there are, the, the higher chances I will, I will have to run away due to social copying, we also studied what we call the twisted Elliott function. That is a, a, a function including the Elliott, but <clears throat> instead of having the increase in dispersal at the decrease of the population, you have the increase of dispersal when population is increasing. Mm -hmm. Because since these two functions, the Elliott and the twisted Elliott contain a few, full universe of different shapes, uh, we, we had to test it. If, if uh, you know, because perhaps with the exponential and the density independent only, uh, we can have a positive density dependent migration processes and, and we are not fitting with, with the mm -hmm. right curve. And, mm -hmm. and indeed, uh, the best fit, and actually it, it is a very good one, uh, was with the Elliott function, with uh, the shape that uh, Daniel was showing. So an initial very slow down uh, uh, dispersal, and when the individuals achieve more or less half of the population, the, the population starts migrating very fast. And then interestingly, there is a kind of slowing down again at the, at the end of the patch, uh, when population density is very, very, very small, but in the, it, it, they are still uh, going out from, from the patch. So this is, these are the main reasons uh, based on uh, 
strong ecological uh, concepts. But of course, uh, if we use, so perhaps we have, could use other functions, but the Elliot uh, has this uh, universe of no, functions. No, I, 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 uh, I, I understand. I, I understand much better now. Really, you want to go from independent to inverse relationships. Yeah, so exactly. Really is, exactly. So now I got I got the point better. But okay. but I saw I saw that you you were having a nice fit also with density independent. I saw in the slide, no. So one yeah. of the well, it was, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think, know. It, yeah, it was, was looking good. I don't know most. whether quantitatively is as good or not. But yeah. but qualitatively, you were showing the, the also mm -hmm. nice. Fit. Yeah, I, I think I think Luis Alzada has a question, and and he was the 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 one that uh, was working very hard in this fitting. So perhaps he can say yeah. something else. Go ahead, Luis. Okay. Simply, uh, simply, I would like to say just very shortly that uh, the, the, for me, the very important feature about this, this function, which is inspired in the Elliot sigmoid, but then it's tuned uh, because it's inverted and uh, manipulated. The important thing is how it is parameterized. And the, the parameters, playing with the parameters, you can reproduce almost any reasonable behavior with this function in a certain zone. So manipulating parameters, really, we could feel, we could, we could draw in black a rectangle of possibilities with uh, several functional forms uh, with this modified Elliot sigma. Maybe the other thing to say is that we choose Elliot because it's, it has a very simple formula. From a computational point of view, this is important. There are no exponential hyperbolic tangents and such things, which uh, for extreme values are difficult to compute. And sigmoid is just a quotient and sums and such things, okay? But the, but the important thing is that playing with parameters, we can reproduce almost any nonlinear behavior, reasonable one, because of course, with many, many maxima and minima, you cannot reproduce this, but, but any reasonable in this setting. And, and this is what it gives the flexibility of this function. And, and, I, this, I, is, and this is the trick that it was possible to do the fitting. It's uh, it's nice because in ecology we have these um, these ideas of null models, right? So you, we yes. have these null models and and we play with that a lot in, in statistics. Here is like you you plan a null model of all possible relationships between two variables, no? Uh, with this idea and 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 I think it's an interesting approach. I've never seen that, so you can really think uh, like have a very null hypothesis about what is the relationship. Yeah, in fact, now that you said null hypothesis, mm -hmm. uh, this is exactly what, what we had in mind in mm -hmm. doing this. We were kind of thinking in a, in a test hypothesis, in a test uh, uh, con, uh, in a test uh, hypothesis test, sorry, uh, almost in the statistical point of view. And mm -hmm. This is... Yeah. Cool, very nice. Uh, so I really recommend uh, for those who have not read this book uh, of Daniel, a recent book that he did, did on, on social dynamics and perturbation with all these ideas. It's a very nice book with lots of examples. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you want to know more, either contact him or, or just read the book and read the book and contact him, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I look forward. Uh, for comments. Okay, so I think we should we should be moving if unless there's someone else that wants to ask another question. And uh, we move ahead and now is the turn of, of David Alonso. David, are you somewhere? Not really. Okay, give me just uh, a moment.
Hola. Okay. Yes, now now we can hear you. So you can you can share your screen. So Hola. Hi David. Please you, um, you can yeah, you shall can try I to start? Share. Yeah, yeah, you can share your screen and I'm going to introduce you while you're doing that. Okay. Um, so David Alonso, he's a researcher at, at the center. Um, uh, um, <laughs> center of uh, Advanced Studies in, in Blanes. And he got the position here in 2018. Uh, he's been, uh, well, he's a uh, strange case. Uh, he's physicist and biologist. And, and he's been always interested in the interdisciplinary study of ecology and, and integrating physics, maths, and biology. And his uh, main focus on research topics have been on the evaluations of risk of spread and emergence of infectious diseases, and also on understanding the mechanisms uh, of maintainers, uh, maintenance and loss of uh, biodiversity in ecological communities. So his talk is going to be uh, on uh, HIV epidemic dynamics and a case study in Madagascar. So David, you have um, about 25 minutes and so that we can have five minutes for discussion. And just recall people, uh, audience here, that uh, if you have any question, you can put it in the chat 10, 10 minutes before uh, the end of the, se of, the, of the talk of David. Okay, David, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's always Lord very strange to talk to screen, uh, but I know you are there supporting me and listening to me. So I will, I will try to keep this in mind. Uh, first of all, let me apologize because I didn't uh, give a title of my talk uh, before as you have seen in the, in the booklet. Um, the reason of, um, for that is that um, I've been hesitating between presenting the piece of work I'm going to present uh, or uh, all the work we have been doing in relation to COVID-19 epidemics uh, here uh, in uh, at SEAP uh, with Frederic Bartomeus and uh, a very talented postdoc, uh, Vicente Jimenez Ontiveros. So that work is still in progress, and uh, we, I, would, I would have liked to present something, but rather than I'm going to present, so I'm going to be conservative, and I'm going to present this, which is kind of a piece of work already uh, submitted, and it is in a, in a more advanced stage. So this work has been done in collaboration with um, Xavier Vallès, um, he is a P PhD and, and, and also medical doctor, and, um, and, and he likes adventures. So he has been uh, collaborating with NGOs and, and, and um, international agencies traveling the world and, and uh, as a doctor and, and trying to implement uh, programs to control uh, several infectious diseases. Um, so um, my my acknowledgments for 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 his uh, work and and also um, it has been very nice to work <clears throat> with him in this project. So um, here, one thing I want to say, as you will see, here are some facts you can read on in the background about about um, HIV. But uh, I have uh, titled also this uh, talk uh, as um, prediction in the face of data scarcity. So, so as you will see, data on disease in Madagascar are, are scarce and, and, and fragmented. And, and uh, this work tried to show that in spite of this, you can do some uh, predictions. Uh, so I love also this work because rather than focusing on big data, uh, we have focused on little data. And I think this, is, uh, this has been very challenging, but, uh, but uh, sometimes I, I uh, don't like big data approaches because I'm not sure to what extent big data uh, fosters 
or hinders the development of good theory. While if you focus on little data, you will have to develop theory to understand what's going on. Uh, well, if we had the coffee break like uh, we should, we could keep discussing about, about these ideas and, and, and uh, big data or little data and so on and so forth. So it's a pity that we are not gonna have a coffee break as we should, but this is uh, the pandemics, right? So um, uh, HIV still is a problem. Um, so the United Nations Development Goals for, um, uh, stated that in 2030, this uh, disease should be eradicated, but the milestones for 2020 has been all missed. So it seems that we will have to uh, deal with the disease for some years. Um, so the focus of this uh, work is trying to explain why um, different countries and different subregions show so disparate epidemic profiles. So in Southern Africa, uh, most countries have uh, a well-established uh, um, uh, HIV epidemics with prevalences in the whole populations over 20%. However, Madagascar, of course, is an island, uh, but showed a very uh, low epidemic profile with less than 1%. And this is astonishing. So what are the underlying reasons that may explain why this is so? Um, what I was talking about is what are our, our data? The data we took as a departure for this study are, mm, they come from two sources. They are disease data and demographic data. So disease data are only uh, two years of um, um, measuring uh, sexual worker population and the prevalence within this uh, group uh, of population, this is this, this subpopulation. So in in two different years. So uh, that this is all we had to begin with in terms of our disease data. Um, I'll be talking always about se sexual workers, and I will. I, I I want to make a disclaimer here because um, because. Of course, sexual work is not a typical work, and and it's uh, uh, it's really a kind of work we should eradicate also. So um, I'll do it just just for short, and that's what the literature does. But um, I wanted to make this disclaimer here. Um, Demographic data are quite detailed. So, so United Nations compiled demographic data quite uh, uh, with uh, uh, quite high accuracy, and and you you get life tables that are quite complete in in several ages and so on. At least from 2000, and we have used we have we have used data uh, from from 2000 uh, until uh, 2016. Uh, and how we have uh, proceeded then, so we built a model. Uh, this is a, a mathematical conference. So, so we, we of course built a mathematical model, right? And uh, the mathematical model is based on these uh, typical uh, features about the, the, the natural history of uh, the HIV infection. So, um, this infection um, presents a, a, an acute infection phase. Uh, the subscript I is the is is representing this 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 stage, and then there is a latency. So so a latency stage or chronical phase. We represented this by C, 
And then, then um, when the immune system uh, completely uh, uh, falls down and, and uh, breaks apart, so to speak, then um, any opportunistic infection can sort of be responsible for the actual death of the individual. And we enter in this AIDS phase and what, what, what's shown here with the subscript A. So we have this uh, SICA model and, um, and then we considered um, uh, that the female population, the women population is uh, distributed in different subpopulations, um, um, sex worker population and non-sex worker population. And then uh, that young, Mm, between 15 and 27 years old uh, women and uh, older women. This is uh, represented by this subscript uh, uh, zero or one and with this kind of transition alpha uh, that um, is sort of adjusted or mm, fitted by the model but within this uh, uh, idea that it's gonna be mm, uh, about, uh, you know, mm, it, it, it has to be interpreted as the average time young uh, females stay in this stage, particularly in relation to uh, sexual preferences of, of, of males. So there is also uh, a sexual preference parameter and um, the full list of parameters comes uh, after the description of the mathematical model. So here uh, we have, in fact, uh, four equations for the um, uh, males and then 16 equations for the females. And then we will have that uh, what it is modeled here is the adult population. So this Fi has to be interpreted as the uh, number of males entering sexual maturity per year. And then there is a, a transmission parameter, which is this beta, um, which is sexual encounters. And then this Px, which is the probability given a sexual encounter with a female which is infected, what is the probability of transmission? And this, this, this X is defined uh, in equations two to four, and is where sexual uh, preferences are included, and also the fact that uh, transmission during the infectious phase is much higher. This is the, 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 this C parameter uh, here. I don't know whether I can show some uh, uh, something here. So I'm talking about this uh, C here is the, the parameter uh, representing how much infective is an acute infected individual with respect an individual which is in the chronic phase. This X are, are called uh, all over like fractions, but they are not truly fractions uh, because this uh, C here can be greater than, than one. And uh, this is uh, an F, the total uh, female population. Of, of course, uh, there is an equation like that for each of the female groups. There are four female groups. And then I, uh, the model have uh, uh, 16 equations for females and for equations is, is a 20D system, actually. So uh, the, here, for instance, um, you can see that um, this term here uh, is the effective fraction um, mm, at which uh, given that there is an encounter with, with an infected male. Uh, so it, it, it weights kind of the probability of encountering an infected male uh, by considering that um, 
that uh, the infection can come either from acute infected individual or chronically infected individual. Uh, so, um, as said, the model has 20 uh, uh, equations. Uh, here, I, as I represented also the um, uh, sex worker population uh, of all uh, women or older women. And these are the parameters that have been, uh, uh, so the, the, the list of parameters in the model. So it's interesting to observe that the, the, the model has two um, kind of parameters, the demographic parameters and the disease transmission parameters. These parameters uh, here uh, are uh, these recruitment rate into, ad, into adult uh, population uh, or uh, sexual uh, mature population. This, this is the number of uh, males and females that enter the adult population um, uh, per year. And, uh, and then there are, the, the, there, I also talked about the, this parameter. Um, and, and then there are these sigma parameters that control how the distribution in the different female groups will be distributed the total female population. So uh, these parameters can be fitted in a, in a first round of uh, fitting by using only demographic data, as I am gonna show. So, uh, and then there are all the list of uh, disease transmission parameters. What, so the approach we have taken here is, is what's called empirical Bayesian in the sense that uh, I'm not using MCMC, but I am uh, um, using previous knowledge and here are the references all these ranges come from to constrain the searches I am doing for the best parameters that uh, uh, give uh, or represent the data or the information we have about the data in the best possible way. Um, sorry. Um, so I wanted to um, insist in, in, in that um, when you sum all over the equations, um, or if, if you want, in, in the absence of disease transmission, uh, the model can be collapsed in only five equations. And if you sum the four equations for the females, you have a very simple representation of demography. So the adult population uh, grows as a balance between uh, recruitment rates in sexual maturity and, and deaths. Um, these uh, are the parameters that can be estimated from life tables and demographic data. I'm not going to go into detail of this, but the model in the end is forced because these parameters will be changing every year by these two uh, parameters, the recruitment rates and the death rate. In the in case of the death rate resulted to be quite sort of constant, but the uh, recruitment rates into the sexual mature um, age um, uh, change from year to year and are estimated from demographic data from life tables. Um, so the model, uh, when, um, when we consider uh, that, the, that the parameters are all constant, um, the model can be analyzed. It have a stability uh, point that can be calculated through the intersection of these two curves, and the full transmission model. And it has the invariably this sigmoid-like uh, shape uh, into this, this global stable stage. Uh, however, 
to analyze the data we have, we uh, consider that these recruitment rates uh, were changing from year to year. And then we were fitting our model as a, as a, as a forced model uh, uh, through these uh, time dependent parameters. But as said, we were leading or dealing with uh, little data. And we have only two points of disease data in the group of sexual workers. It means that we could not simply use these two points. We have to make some extra assumption to try to uh, fit or try to find the more plausible parameters. And what we did is assuming that uh, the, the population, so the disease was expanding um, since at least 2000 or, or even before. So uh, as you can see here, between 2012 and 2016, all, all cities across uh, Madagascar are experiencing this increase in prevalence in this uh, key population. So uh, since we know that any um, con human to human uh, transmitted disease um, um, has an exponential phase in a, in, the, in a sea of susceptibles, we can assume that this exponential uh, started well before uh, in 2000, for instance, also, we, all, although we were trying with different initial years, but, and what we found, for instance, is that years later than 2004 uh, start to being less plausible as years before this uh, 2004, meaning that the disease and the, the, the the uh, time scale imposed by the ranges of parameters I have shown is not uh, rapid enough to reach the levels of um, prevalence already observed in 2016. So in this way, through this assumption that the disease is um, oh, has been since 2000 or even before, slowly um, expanding in a, in, 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 in a very um, uh, slow manner, but expanding, exponentially expanded, expanding, we, 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 we then use uh, pseudo data that, that are this exponential expansion and uh, uh, between uh, 2000 and 2016 that has the levels on the, of 2016 and then these were our disease pseudodata we use to find the best parametric configurations. Um, so um, the, the model uh, can be also, um, so the, using the method of the next generation matrix, uh, the R naught of the model can be also calculated and expressed in terms of model parameters. Um, and, and, and here we use the model parameters in 2000 to plot R naught in terms of um, uh, beta Y, which, which is the um, encounter, sexual encounters of per capita of males, and this probability of uh, acquiring the disease when a healthy man encounters an infected uh, female. And, um, and our estimate in 2000 is this, um, this point here. And, uh, and, and uh, in the literature, we were finding that circumcision could have delayed somehow disease expansion in countries like Madagascar, where this is a general practice. And uh, in the literature, you also find 
that there is a 60% reduction of um, um, the probability of transmission uh, if males um, has gone through circumcision. However, uh, what we show here is that even in that case, even considering that, that uh, the, uh, this probability of transmission gets reduced through three, uh, circumcision, this reduction would have not uh, be, been enough to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to stop disease expansion. So uh, it is possible that disease has expanded uh, um, like at the lower pace, but is uh, we 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 think that the disease is still expanding, and 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 we show here that uh, according to the, the our estimates, uh, this uh, reduction created by circ circumcision was not enough to stop disease expansion. So uh, here um, uh, I show uh, some, uh, some results on uh, disease prevalences um, in the different cities in, in Madagascar. Uh, both the data itself and the predictions. So the, the, um, the data uh, in 2012, 2016, and the predictions, I hope you see my, so uh, what I'm marking here. So these are the data, this is the prediction, um, and this is percentage values within sexual workers, very high prevalence of the disease within this key, key group and uh, within the general population. So of course our model use little data and make this assumption about disease expansion, but we, in any place we said that the prevalences of the disease once established uh, should reach these uh, 20% levels, uh, more or less in, in all the cities. I said this because in that map I presented at the beginning, in countries where the disease is well established, uh, you never has 70% of disease prevalence in the general population. You have between 15 and 25% as our model is predicting. So uh, here is the whole temporal evolution of the model showing uh, also the data we had. Uh, uh, and then under the assumption of disease expansion and, um, and the predictions for uh, the next uh, decade. Um, So in, um, in conclusion, so uh, the approach we took allows uh, for um, prediction even in, in spite of little data we have. So we can make uh, prevalence projections up to year 2000 and, and, and uh, so in the, for the next decade. Oh, sorry, what happened? I took something, okay. Uh, okay, okay, we are here. So um, our model across cities, I show it only for Antananarivo, but all the cities presented these sigmoid-like prevalence curves, reaching stable prevalences around 2013 and within nine to 24%. Uh, and similar to other high prevalence regions in Southern Africa. Also the estimations we did of R0, our model R0 in 2000, uh, um, when incidence is assumed to be very, very, very low, uh, coincides were, were within real life uh, estimation ranges. Uh, so between four and nine. 
So uh, we conclude that Madagascar may be currently undergoing a transition for a concentrated to a generalized HIV epidemic. And uh, one key factor in uh, driving this is the role of young uh, women and, 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 and sexual work, um, because this is what kind of, is kind of the breach population that takes the disease from this very concentrated profile to a general profile where the disease uh, spreads all over the population. So uh, Xavi Vallez was uh, telling to me that, um, uh, of course, sexual work is not regulated in Madagascar. And, and, and there, is, there is a lot of women that uh, do, do not consider them, themselves sexual workers, but they, they do uh, transactional, what, 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 what Xavi Vallez calls transactional sex. So they do, uh, um, they, they, they uh, have uh, sexual encounters with other guys that may pay for a mobile phone or for, or for uh, uh, you know, clothes or something like that. And this uh, has an incidence in, in the expansion of the epidemics. So uh, what would explain then that, that even, even South Africa uh, uh, so, um, uh, so what, what, what would explain the question I, po I posed at the beginning, that we have several uh, epidemic profiles from low, like Madagascar, to high, like Mozambique and South Africa. Uh, what, what would explain this? So we conclude that there is this dynamical interplay between uh, cultural and geopolitics. And this is what would play a major role in determining the timing and the severity of the transition from a concentrated to a generalized epidemics. And of course, other factors uh, sh uh, could be also a population density or mobility. Uh, but um, so with, with this, Mm, I would sort of finish my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I know that there is a lot of things in details I could not cover, but uh, I'm open to any question and, and uh, any comment from, from you. Thank you. Okay, David, thank you very much. So either you, you can pose questions in the chat or, or raise your hands or, or simply activate your micro. And, and ask questions to David, if you have any. And maybe you can stop sharing, David. Okay. Or, or, or maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Is there any question? So I could not uh, follow totally the 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 talk, uh, and and I had to. You, you were hearing some noises. Uh, we are having some workers here at the center, and I had to deal with with that. So so sorry for that inconvenience. Okay, so if there's no questions, then we should we should stop according to the calendar and, and we go back right to Zep on on 11:45. So we have about 10 minutes uh, for a break. And we'll we'll start with Sylvia. So see you in 10 minutes.
Hello, everybody. Hello, Silvia. Hello. So hopefully we are all here, back. So uh, whenever you want, you can share the screen and I will make a short introduction. So Silvia Cuadrado studied at the University of uh, Autonoma of Barcelona. Uh, she's a mathematician and, and she is now uh, at the Department of, of Maths of, of the University of Autonoma de Barcelona. She spent uh, some time in the University of Utrecht uh, and she's been working a lot on, on ecological models and evolutionary models with focusing or focusing a lot on, on structured populations, which means that uh, she's been using a lot of uh, partial differential equations uh, as mathematical frameworks. And she's recently been doing very interesting work on, on R zeros, as far as I can tell. And uh, exactly, so this is uh, what she's gonna be talking today. Uh, so Silvia, whenever you want, the floor is yours and you have uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, so all yours. Okay, thanks, Pepe. Is the background noise uh, bothering or is it fine? Is, is it? It's fine. We're, okay. I'm not hearing okay. background noise. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, uh, first of all, I, I would like to, to thank the organizers for the for the invitation. It's a it's a very nice uh, conference. I think it, it covers many many biological topics and, and very different mathematical tools. So I'm I'm very happy to participate. So. Um, uh, this talk is, is based on a, on a joint work with, with Angel Calcina and Carlos Barril from the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona and also with Jordi Ripoll from the Universitat de Girona. Um, so here is a, a short outline of the talk. Uh, I will start with a brief introduction to the Malthusian parameter and the basic reproduction uh, number, which um, yeah, unfortunately nowadays is, is very familiar to, to everybody. And, and then I will focus on, on continuously structured populations. That means uh, populations that are uh, not homogeneous, that are heterogeneous with respect to different variables, like for example, age or, or size or age of infection, um, viral load, uh, many variables. And we'll consider two kinds, uh, two kinds of, of structure models, which we have actually called type one and type two, and the, the difference is basically on how the birth terms are. And for each of them, uh, we'll see how to compute the, the basic reproduction number. And um, I will also present two illustrative examples. Uh, the first one is an age of infection model, uh, which we were interested in the model itself, but, but then we applied it to, to estimate some, some parameters of the, of the early stages uh, of the COVID pandemic in Spain and also the, the basic reproduction number. And for the second type of models, I will, I will show the, the well-known uh, size structure population model. Um, okay, so as, as everybody knows, if one wants to study uh, the dynamics of a population that is, that is given by a linear model, so, so we are considering uh, the population at, at low densities, like, like as I said before, on early stages of an epidemic, or also, for example, if you are considering evolutionary models and you want to study if, if a small population is able to evade, uh, the usual approach is to compute the, the Malthusian parameter. The, uh, I called it lambda because it's maybe the, the usual way, but uh, the Malthusian parameter gives the per capita exponential growth rate of, of the population. And we have the usual uh, threshold criterion. So if, if the rate is positive, then the population increases, whereas it decreases if, it, if it's negative. But uh, an alternative uh, equivalent approach uh, consists in, in studying uh, the, the population like uh, from a general generational point of view. So, uh, and, and then we consider the population uh, on a generation basis, and then we consider its multiplication factor. And this, and this leads to the, to the famous now uh, basic reproduction number. Uh, the basic reproduction number was actually uh, introduced in demography, although later on it, it became very, very popular in, in epidemiology. Um, so I, I would like to refer to this nice article of Hans Hesteberg for a, for a historical review on the, on the basic reproduction number. 
Uh, and the definition, it is it, it was it was uh, it already appeared in the in the previous talk by by David, the basic reproduction number, and it is defined as the expected lifetime number of a typical offspring of a of a newborn individual, or if we think in an epidemic context, uh, as the expected number of new infections that a newly infected individual will produce. So uh, the basic reproduction number, it's usually called R not, uh, gives the per generation growth factor. And, and therefore the, the threshold value is one here. So if, if R0 is bigger than one, uh, then uh, uh, if we think in an ecological point of view, then each individual has on average more than one offspring and therefore the population uh, may increase. And uh, if it's uh, smaller than one, then the population will, will decrease. So we have these two indicators, the Malthusian parameter and the basic reproduction number. And they are in principle equivalent to, to measure the growth of a population or, a, or of an epidemic. The advantage sometimes of measuring growth uh, from the generational point of view, so with R0, is that for, for some models, uh, one can obtain uh, explicit expressions of, of R0 in terms of, of the parameters. Um, so uh, for this generational point of view, and this also appeared in the, in the previous talk by David, he talked about the next generation matrix, um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the next generation operator, which is like the infinite dimensional version of what, what David mentioned. And, and actually, as, as far as I know, this concept of next generation operator was introduced by uh, Digman, Hesterbeck and Metz in this article. And actually they, they introduced it in the finite dimensional uh, context, so also for a matrix. And, it's, uh, and, and when I talk about operator, it's because I'm, I'm going to apply to PDs, so I'll be in infinite dimension. And what it does, it, it, it maps a distribution of population to the distribution of population of, of their offspring. And then they define the R0, the basic reproduction number, as the spectral radius of, the, of this next generation operator, which give, uh, gives us this generational growth that I, that I mentioned before. And I also put here this um, nice uh, reference of, of Inaba if, if one is interested uh, more in this uh, next generation operator. Um, okay, so the, now the question is, um, how, how do we derive, how do we compute this next generation operator uh, when we have a particular dynamic, dynamical system, so a particular model? Um, so in, imagine that we can uh, we can divide our model. So we have we have a model. Let's say now let's be mathematical, but I'll try to not to go very much into details. So we have a we are in a Banach lattice. We have a distribution of individuals, and imagine that we can uh, decompose the operator that gives us the dynamics of this matrix in two operators. So we have a birth operator which we call B, and we have an M operator, which gives us uh, the rest of the model, so non-birth terms, so mortality and transitions in general, so how individuals die or change their state. Um, we have some hypotheses. These are a bit natural. B should be positive. It's the birth operator. It will give us the births. Um, M, uh, um, we, it should be such that minus M is a generator of a positive semigroup and that has a spectral bound negative. That's, that is to, to avoid that the, that the population goes to extinction. I get to avoid, sorry, sorry, to ensure that the population goes to extinction if there are no birds. And, and some more technical hypothesis like this operator BN minus one should be bounded and uh, this should be the generator of a positive semigroup. But uh, anyway, what I'm going to argue now is that uh, this operator here, it's the so-called next generation operator when we have a dynamical system that we can uh, write like this. Okay. Um, okay. So as I said, uh, this uh, birth operator and the inverse of, of, of the rest of the, of the operator is uh, the next generation operator. Because uh, if we have a population, you, and, and let us assume that there are no births. So this uh, birth operator doesn't exist. So we have U prime equal to minus MU. Then here, uh, the semi-group applied to the to U is the, is the distribution of the, it gives us the distribution of population at time T. If we multiply by the birth operator in a small time interval, like this one, then what we obtain is the distribution of newborns uh, produced by U in this, in this uh, time interval. And if we integrate for, for all times, then we get the distribution of offspring of U. 
we have to be a bit careful with the with the hypothesis on the operators, but, but that's it. And then uh, we can define the reproduction number as the spectral radius of this next generation operator. So we have a dynamical system. Uh, we can uh, define this next generation operator, and then we can compute the, the basic reproduction number as the spectral radius of, of this operator. Um, but, but one has to be careful because um, we have a particular model and, and we have a decomposition in birth and mortality, or mortality or transition, so the rest, birth and the rest. Uh, the, the, composi the composition might not be unique. And, and then the expression of the basic, then the next generation operator is different. And then the expression of R0 uh, is different. So it depends on what, on what is considered as a birth event. So how we define this birth operator. Here I have very simple example. Uh, let us consider an unstructured population model. Okay, very simple. So we have uh, X of T, X of T is the total population at time T and beta and mu are the per capita birth and mortality rates. And then we compute R0 for this operator. Look, this is the birth operator, and this is the, the inver inverse of, of the end. So, so we have uh, beta over mu uh, is, is R0 for, for this simple model. But we can write this the same, exactly the same model in a different way. If we are thinking, for example, in a cell population model, uh, we have a cell population model, and then the mother divides into two daughters, uh, two daughter cells, and then the mother uh, disappears. Um, so then we could have, uh, these are the two daughters, and this is like a mortality terms. So B, the, the birth operator here will be 2B, and uh, the rest, the M, would be this one, and we get a different expression for R0. But the dynamical system is, is the same. The equation, uh, the equation is the same. Um, it is clear, though, that both have the same threshold. And, and this is very important because otherwise we, we would have a problem here. So one is bigger than one, if and only if uh, the other is. And this is actually the case in general. So that the, that the sign of R0 minus one coincides of the sign of the Malthus parameter. Remember that for the Malthus parameter, we have the threshold with zero and for R0, we have it with one. So the sign uh, of this coincides with the sign of the of the Malthusian parameter, independently of the choice of the decomposition in birth and mortality transition operator, and this was uh, this was shown for the finite dimensional uh, context by Digman, Hester, Hesterbeck, and Roberts, and for the infinite dimensional uh, framework uh, by by Horsby. Eh? Um, okay. So now, now let me give an, an example of, of computing this uh, basic reproduction number using this framework of next generation operators. So now I'll give an example of what we have called type one models. And type one models for us are actually models for which you can compute it. Uh, and then we'll see uh, what happens with, with the other type of models. Um, so let's consider a, a, an example of these type one models which is an, an age of infection structure model. And actually it, it was inspired by this paper of Digman and Cushing, which is a very didactical paper, very nice, uh, nice and easy to read. And, and, and it's uh, for, uh, for infinite dimension. And they consider a population that is divided in asymptomatic individuals and symptomatic individuals. Uh, so inspired by this, we, what we did was to consider the, the uh, infection age structure model introduced by Cormac and McKendrick and add this uh, asymptotic compartment. So we have the, uh, not Cormac, Kermac, McKendrick model, and we, have, uh, we also consider uh, asymptomatic population. So we have uh, the population uh, divided in asymptomatic individuals and symptomatic individuals. And by symptomatic individuals, uh, we mean uh, individuals that show symptoms in such a way that they are detected by the health system. So actually in the compartment of, of asymptomatic, we also include individuals that have symptoms, but that are so mild that they are not detected. So actually uh, to, to, to have it clear, symptomatic for us means detected and asymptomatic means non-detected. Um, 
Okay, and 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 this this was applied to the beginning of the of the pandemic, uh, when when systematic testing was not being done, so asymptomatic individuals were not um, were not uh, considered by the, by the health system. So uh, the population is divided in in four compartments. We have the susceptible individuals, uh, we have the infected asymptomatic, infected symptomatic, so detected and the remove, which are immune and, and disease. And um, we, we, we assume that when there is a newly infected individual, it is asymptomatic. And uh, we denote by tau here, the age of infection. So the, the time that has passed since infection, and this I of tau T uh, is the density with respect to tau of uh, asymptomatic infected individuals. So these asymptomatic individuals are structured, that's why we get the PD, with respect to this age of infection. And, and we assume that uh, when the age of infection reaches a critical value, capital T, uh, which we think it's approximately one week now from, from experience, then the asymptomatic individuals are either detected with probability P, so they show symptoms and are detected by the health system, or with probability one minus P, uh, they, well, when they are detected, they become symptomatic, and with probability one minus P, uh, they recover and, and become immune, passing to the, to the removed uh, compartment. Um, okay, so these are, these are the equations uh, that model the, the dynamics of, of this population. Uh, of the disease. So we have the, sus the susceptible individuals that they become infected and uh, assuming the, the usual mass action law. So um, beta one of tau uh, denotes the transmission rate of asymptomatic individuals. So this is the question for the susceptible. Beta one of tau is the transmission rate of asymptomatic and is the total population. So um, this term here is giving us the uh, infections of susceptible by asymptomatics and beta 2 denotes the transmission rate of symptomatic individuals so this term here j of t is the population of, of symptomatics which is not a structure uh, so this term here gives us the infections of susceptible by symptomatic um, the second equation is the equation for the infected asymptomatic, which is a transport equation. So the individuals move with respect to tau, with respect to this age of infection, and they recover uh, at a rate uh, gamma one of tau. Uh, the third equation is for the infected symptomatic individuals. And what we have is that with probability P, when they, when they reach this uh, critical age of infection, uh, capital T, they become symptomatic and they develop symptoms. So they appear here in the, in the symptomatic compartment. And this gamma two is the recovery rate for symptomatic. This equation, I won't pay much attention to it. This is the equation for, for, the, for, the, reco for the removed or the recovery. So asymptomatic, asymptomatic that recover with this rate gamma one, then also asymptomatic that recover with probability one minus P when they reach this, uh, this uh, critical value of the age of infection and uh, um, symptomatic that, that recover with, with or die with rate gamma two. And moreover, we have a, a boundary condition. We have a boundary condition that gives the new infections of asymptomatic individuals, which is this term here. Uh, at age of infection tau, we have the new infection of asymptomatics, and it is the sum of two terms, the infections produced by asymptomatics and the infections produced by, by symptomatic individuals. Okay, so and now what, what we would like to do is compute the basic re reproduction number for, for this model. Uh, so we look at the system close to the initial stage of the pandemic. So we, we linearize uh, around the, the disease-free uh, steady state. Uh, so the number of susceptible is constant and equal, equal to the total population. Uh, so the question for the susceptible disappears and we obtain these equations. Uh, we obtain these linearized equations for the, for the infected population. 
And, and now we want to use the, the next generation operator framework to, to compute the basic reproduction number. So what we have to do is identify what we consider as a birth event and what we consider as the rest, mortality transition. And what we did was we considered as a birth event the moment in which an asymptomatic individual is reported. So the moment in which an asymptomatic is detected by the, by the health system. And because actually this was the data that, that we had then at, at, at that point, um, because there was no, as I said before, no continuous testing. So in blue here, this is the birth event because it is uh, when an asymptomatic individual is detected. And in red, you have everything else in the model. So uh, for us, R0 means the expected number of symptomatic individuals, okay? So not the expected number of asymptomatic individuals, which one would think is, is the, then we would have the total number of infected because uh, every individual starts as an asymptomatic. But for us, uh, R0 is the expected number of symptomatic individuals that a newly symptomatic individual will produce because that was the data that we had. And because actually this, to compute this R0 also has some uh, advantages with respect to, to control measures. So now a bit more, I'll go a bit fast with it maybe, uh, with, the, with the mathematics. So, so for, for this model, we have this ab abstract Cauchy problem in a one times R. So we have the equation for the infected asymptomatic and the equation for the infected symptomatic. We have this birth operator and this mortality operator. Um, and this is just uh, putting it in a, in a mathematical way. And as, I, as we said before, we want to compute this uh, next uh, generation operator, uh, which is BM minus one. And then uh, R naught will be the spectral radius of this uh, next generation operator. But uh, since the birth operator is one dimensional, in this case, that makes it much easier. Uh, so the next generation operator for this model is, is a one dimensional range operator. And then we can just compute R naught uh, as the second component of, of, this, of this operator applied to, to zero one. So then you can, you can write it explicitly. As I said before, um, R naught has this advantage that sometimes you can write it explicitly. So we compute the, the inverse of, of this operator applied to zero one. Um, uh, so this is just by, by, by standard calculus, eh? solving an, an ODE and an algebraic equation. Then we apply the birth operator, which maybe I went uh, slightly fast here. The birth operator is, is this one here because the birth term was, the birth operator was only uh, this one. And um, so it's a probability P, and this means evaluation at this critical value capital T. So, so then when we apply the birth operator here, then we just get uh, multiplying by P and evaluating this at capital T. This is uh, actually a survival probability. This is the integral of one, gamma one, but, the, but I, I don't really want to go into into all the details, but, to, but, but you can compute it explicitly. And what is important to mention also is that notice that this expression of, of R0, uh, it's only meaningful if we consider gamma two positive and this integral here smaller than one. Gamma two positive is, is natural because gamma two, gamma was the recovery rate for the symptomatic population. So equal to zero means that the detected symptomatic individuals never die nor recover. So that doesn't make sense. And this thing here, this hypothesis, uh, beta one was the transmission rate for the asymptomatic. And this is actually the survival probability, okay? So uh, this here, this integral here, uh, denotes the mean number of secondary infections that an asymptomatic individual, asymptomatic individual, will produce before reaching capital P. So if it's bigger than one, then it means that the, vir the virus is being transmitted in, through the asymptomatics uh, in the population. So it, there is transmission in the population that is not detected. That would give an infinite value of, of our R0, meaning that a, symptom, a, a symptomatic <laughs> individual will cause many secondary symptomatic cases due to this, this spread of the virus through the asymptomatic, asymptomatic population. Sorry, because I, it's, it's a bit... Uh, complicated to say this. And now I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit fast here. Um, so 
I also wanted to mention that actually, if you don't use this approach of the next generation operator, you can compute also for this model are not uh, from the definition, just interpreting the, the model ingredients and the definition as the expected number of secondary infections. Uh, you could compute it. And what we did was to apply it under some hypothesis uh, to determine, actually one was uh, to assume that the transmission rate for the asymptomatic was constant so that the transmission was not changing during the period without the transmission rate during the period without symptoms. And, and we did determine this parameter, this transmission rate based on the Spanish data during, during the spring, during the peak of the pandemic. And we also computed the R0 and, and we got that uh, R0 was um, infinity. So the, the virus was expanding uh, within the asymptomatic population before the lockdown. And after in two weeks immediately after the lockdown, then then it then it was controlled. So then it was smaller than that. And 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 here is the the, the reference where we did all this. Now the second part, I don't have much time, but just to give you the the idea, because it's a bit more technical, but only so that so that you have the idea. Let's switch to the other type of models, type two models. And these are models basically for which you cannot compute the next generation operator that or you cannot define it in a in an appropriate uh, um, lattice because these are models for which the density of individuals belongs to the Banach uh, lattice, but the density of newborns does not belong to X. So before we, we were working in, in L1, in the other model, but think, for example, um, in the age structure population. So what, what we are thinking is actually of continuously structured populations that have concentrated st states at birth. So like for the age population model, that all individuals are born with the same age, okay? Um, so, so actually that they, it, you, what you have is an equation for the M part, but the inflow of newborns, the birth, appears, appears as a boundary condition, okay? So in general, you, you, cannot, you cannot define this, this next generation operator. And now a bit for the end, the, the slides with that's some mathematics, but just, uh, I just want to give you the idea. What we did in order to compute the next generation operator for this type of models, think of models with concentrated state at, at states at birth, like the, the age structure model. Um, so you don't have this birth operator, but what we did was uh, consider a sequence of models in L1. So consider, consider a sequence of type one models for which we can define this next generation operator that is somehow in some way approximate this other model that we want to compute the, the basic reproduction number. So we consider a sequence of type one models, a sequence in the sense that we have, we'll have a, a birth operator here, a sequence of birth operator, depending on K, that, as I said, approximate in some way uh, the other model. And these are the hypotheses. I, I won't go very much into it, but one I would like to mention, and it's that, that these birth operators will consider them of finite rank and actually of, of rank one. Um, and then, um, let's see, if, uh, and even, even more, more precisely, even more precisely, if we assume that the, that the birth operator for the sequence that we are building in order to approximate the model for which we cannot compute the next generation operator. So if we consider that the birth operator has this shape, uh, so some positive, uh, some positive linear functional applied to U times this phi of K, which is actually represents the distribution of offspring. I'm talking about the birth operator. Um, so if we assume that this sequence of n minus one applies to phi k converges to this function, I have to mention it because it, it will appear in a moment, phi infinity. So if we assume that this convergence holds and also this one, then we can define R naught for the type two model as the limit of R naught for this sequence of type one models for which we can compute the basic reproduction uh, number. And this is just applying the hypothesis. So it is a spectral radius of this uh, next generation operator that we can compute here because it's in the same state space. Um, this is just um, using the particular shape of, of this birth operator. This is using the convergence and, and, and 
No, this is using that it has, uh, it's one dimensional, the range of this operator, and here it's using the convergence. So actually, um, forget if you want about the technical details, but the thing is that you can define R0 uh, as this uh, functional, positive linear functional that was given as the birth operator applied to this uh, limit function that we obtain from, from the limit of this sequence here. So the thing is that uh, if we can compute this, then, then, then we have this um, basic reproduction number. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, eh, Fede? So uh, if, like we said before, we assume concentrated state at, states at birth, forget if you want about the hypothesis. So if we want that the, that the individuals are uh, born in the limit case, are born with the, with the same age, for example, or size or whatever, we have to assume that the sequence of birth operators are concentrating uh, at this value. So if we uh, assume this, and um, we consider the green function for the operator M, so that the, this operator M minus one can be written in this way, then uh, we can compute this uh, psi infinity function uh, that we had here, uh, that we had here, that actually once we have this, we, we have R naught. Um, so this is just applying the, this, this equality. So uh, psi infinity is this limit, and then we apply the, the green function. And then since this sequence is concentrating at, at a value at zero, for example, then we get this. So actually we can compute the basic reproduction number um, explicitly, if all the hypotheses hold, using the, the green function of, of the transition operator and uh, the, the birth operator. And this is the, uh, the, the last example. If we consider the classical uh, linear um, size dependent population model, so this is the equation, many people maybe are familiar with it. Uh, so we have the individual growth here. So U is the density of individuals uh, with respect to size X. And the evolution is given by, by this equation. So we have the, the growth in, in size and we have the mortality. So this is the M operator and then the birth operator, all individuals are born. We assume that all individuals are born with the same size X zero. And then we have this birth operator, which has this form that I mentioned before. So we apply like this theory here and what we have, if you want, uh, again, forget about the mathematics, but we can compute the green, the green uh, function for, for the operator M for this model. So we can compute this limit function, psi infinity, and we can compute uh, using this uh, convergence that we proved, uh, we can compute R0 using this method for this uh, size structure model, which is actually, which coincides uh, as it should be, with the um, R0 uh, for the size structure model that, that it has been computed in the, in the literature by using the, the definition. Like for example, you can, you can see this uh, reference of the book of Janelli and Pugliese, if you want to see it. Um, I think that's it. This I'll, I'll just skip. This uh, were the reference that appear, but since it's recorded, they, they are all in there. And thank you for your attention. And sorry if it was a bit long. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, no, just a slight, a slight delay. It's, it's, it's okay. Um, I think it's a very, very inspiring and very timely research. And if anyone has uh, some questions, uh, please go ahead. Raise your hands or put them in the chat so I can read them. I'm, I'm very curious about, about knowing the, re the applied results. Uh, that you have in that paper, and and uh, I had this question whether whether you were you were able to infer asymptomatic uh, growth there. Uh, well, actually, what, what we got was that uh, what we estimated was these uh, transmission rates, mm -hmm. and and actually what what we got was that um, um, after the lockdown, the transmission rate for the symptomatic was much smaller because in the symptomatic mm -hmm. individuals were detected. Uh, about the R naught, what we got was that uh, before the before the lockdown, it was in, in, infinite. So we got mm -hmm. an infinite value. So so what we got was that the virus was was spreading, spreading uh, through the asymptomatic world. population. But then when applying the data two weeks after the lockdown, then then it was uh, finite already. And then this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. 
So any, any other question? You can send them to me in the future. If <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I cannot see the faces, then it's very difficult to <laughs> point out who might be willing to say something. Okay, so uh, here we have a, a question by Marta Pardo. Uh, why have you structured the asymptotic? Exactly. Okay, I, I can understand that question. Why, why, why you, you did structure the asymptomatic and, and not the symptomatic ones? For simplicity. Okay. Actually. Yeah, she, she, you're totally right. I mean, I mean, you could also you you should structure also the, the symptomatic population, but but it was for simplicity. Since we were we did the asymptomatic because we were more interested in this spreading of the, of the virus and in this computation of unknown, but, but you're totally right. That actually pro probably it could be done. We thought about it afterwards, but we didn't do, but, but probably you could do things also as uh, having a, a structured symptomatic population. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if that's all, then next speaker, is Josep Sardanyes. Thanks, Silvia. Okay. Let's welcome Josep. So Josep uh, uh, is also a, a, a rare, weird abyss. Uh, she, she, uh, he, he, he's a biologist. He did uh, his PhD at the University of Barcelona uh, in 2009. Uh, and he joined uh, um, so that, no, that's the master. Then he joined the complex uh, systems lab at the University of Pompeu Fabra. And then he, all of a sudden, because I was there at that point as well, he got in love with chaos and, and nonlinear systems and dynamics, uh, which is truly uh, a case uh, because uh, as far as I can tell, uh, by that time at, uh, when we were doing biology, we were not seeing any maths at all. Uh, then he moved on, on to several uh, postdocs uh, in Valencia with Santiago Elena, uh, also uh, in San Francisco with David Gladstone. And, uh, and then he went back to the Complex Systems Lab and now he's currently, uh, since November 2016, in the Center uh, uh, of Mathematical Research here in, in, in Bella Terra in the University Autonoma of Barcelona, where he finally got a tenure and that's how it goes uh, in Spain. Sometimes things come very, very late. And now he's building up his own, his own lab, which is the Nonlinear Dynamics and Evolution uh, Lab. Okay, Josep, you can go ahead. Uh, also, he's part of the organizers. Uh, he's organizing all this uh, incredible conference. So thank you uh, in advance. And now your turn. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Fede, for the presentation. So can you see my slides? Yes. And the yes. Yeah. Okay. Everything is okay. Yeah. Okay. So my talk uh, aims to claim um, what uh, I have named normal forms in ecology. We could also uh, talk about normal forms in biology. And um, in the same, well, before starting my, my talk, I would like to um, uh, read a quotation that for me was really Inspiring, inspiring. Fortunately, I, I found it many years ago. So uh, this is by Robert MacArthur. Uh, and uh, the quote says, scientists are perennially aware that it is best not to trust theory until it is conf confirmed by evidence. But it is equally true that it is best not to put too much faith in facts until they have been confirmed by theory. Okay, so sometimes um, scientists, uh, we tend to trust a lot uh, the, what we see in the lab or in the field. And, and, and this is obviously uh, uh, a very good way of doing science, but um, I'm, I'm showing this because I think that uh, the modeling uh, of um, biological systems with uh, mathematical and computational biology is very important to have a fundamental understanding on what is going on in nature and also to make predictions. Uh, in, in, in sometimes because not always it's, it's possible to make uh, sharp predictions. Okay, so as I was saying uh, here, uh, uh, my talk is the claim to the study of normal forms in, in biology or in ecology. 
So you know that normal forms are very used in mathematics. They are very useful to reduce problems and um, take clear results about mathematical phenomena. So a normal form is the most simple expression in mathematics that allows to explain some mathematical phenomena. phenomena. Uh, here you can see the case for the Sadanov bifurcation. So this is just this quadratic uh, differential equation. Uh, so this is a very simple uh, expression, but as I will show in the talk, we have seen uh, this kind of bifurcation uh, in many sim systems, even in realistic systems. I mean, experimental data. So here uh, from this equation, we can see that there are two equilibrium points. Uh, when epsilon is negative, oops, sorry, when epsilon is, is negative, uh, the fixed points exist, okay? When epsilon is equal to zero is what we, you, you can see in this animation. These two equilibrium points, one that is stable and another that is unstable, collide and disappear, and they go to the complex uh, phase space. And, and this is related uh, to the talk by Nuria Fajella. Uh, and despite they are, uh, outside from the real line, they are still influencing the dynamics in the real line and, and the, th the things we see in, in the world, okay? Uh, this is the bifurcation diagram for the normal form. So we have stable point and then stable point that collide um, at the, at, uh, when epsilon is uh, zero, okay? But this is uh, the typical bifurcation diagram that we found uh, in biological uh, models because usually we have more complex um, interactions here. So we have competition, we have uh, different types of decay, uh, cooperation, whatever. And this is um, usually what we see. So we have this, a stable node and a saddle, okay? But usually we have another attractor that is the origin that in population dynamics involves the extinction of the populations. And this is a locally asymptotically um, attractor, okay? So before the bifurcation is a local attractor, typically in, in biological models, but after the bifurcation, uh, if there are no other uh, invariant attracting objects, it, it becomes uh, globally stable, okay? So this bifurcation uh, is usually found in biological systems in which we have strong nonlinearities. For example, in models where we combine cooperation and competition. Um, this is actually where we, uh, we, where I have been studying this bifurcation a lot, uh, and we found it in the hypercycle model that I will explain later. Also in in recovery dynamics after mass extinctions, and also uh, for ecological facilitation and also in models uh, uh, with what we call Ali effects. So the Ali effect is a, a very important uh, effect in, uh, in ecology and in biology. And the Ali effect is a relation between the fitness of, of a population and its size, the number of individuals, okay? This is uh, very important in processes where we have uh, um, mandatory uh, interactions between individuals, for example, in mating limitation, predation saturation or uh, co cooperative hunting, for example. There are a lot, there is a huge literature on Ali effects and, and this is a very interesting topic. So here I am showing some um, systems in which we have cooperation at different scales, okay? So at the, let's say molecular scale, uh, we have a lot of works on ribozymes. Ribozymes are, are pieces of RNA that have catalytic activity and uh, this is one of the uh, cores of the hypercycle theory. This is a hypercycle in which we have different molecules that provide catalysis to other species in a circular way, okay? And this type of system usually have saddle node bifurcations. It is interesting to say that in the last years, there have been a lot of research in, in experimental research on ribozymes. And there is a paper in Nature for a few years ago in which the, the scientists put mixtures of ribozymes, random mixtures, and ribozymes were able to self-organize in catalytic cycles, okay? There are many other works. So another example of cooperation is in viruses. So you know that we have segmented viruses and multipartite viruses. So these viruses typically have the genome 
fragmented in different parts. And for example, for multipartite viruses, which are very common in plants, we need different fragments that are encapsulated, uh, uh, that have different genomes that are encapsulated uh, in separate particles. They need to co-infect the cell to make infection uh, progress. Then, of course, we also have cooperation at the level of cells in our body, in tissues. Cancer cells have also a lot of cooperation mechanisms between them to fight uh, the immune system, for example. And uh, last but not least, in complex ecosystems, here we have a lot of nice examples. For example, plant facilitation. Uh, plant facilitation is, is a kind of indirect cooperation in which the presence of uh, another species or another individual of the same species is facilitating the establishment and reproduction of, of a given individual because it is modifying in some sense the ecological conditions, for example, retaining water or fixing the soil. Then we have also cooperative hunting, in which here, of course, we have a very important effect of population density in the success of the population. And this is what the Ali effect is. Then also we have a lot of examples of bird alerts in the forest. So these uh, birds uh, usually make uh, loud uh, songs when there are predators to, uh, surrounding the, the place. So then uh, the individuals are aware of these predators and can protect. And then a very nice example uh, that I, I, well, I think it's, it's very peculiar is about uh, vampires. This is the Desmodus rotundus species in which the females uh, do a thing that is called blood sharing. So there is a colony of, of vampires and if any female is not able to get food, other females provide uh, the, these females that are starving with, with, with blood. Okay, so, so they regurgitate the blood and, and then the colony as a whole can survive. Okay, so as I have said, there are fundamental interactions in ecology. One is cooperation, of course, uh, sorry, competition, of course, but the other is cooperation, which has been less studied than uh, antagonistic interactions such as predator prey or host parasite in the ecological literature. Okay, this is a... Um, this is, a, a, I think, very important work in the field of system biology. Uh, this, is, this work appeared like nine years ago. This is from the uh, Jeff Gore's lab. Uh, Jeff Gore's is going to give a talk tomorrow afternoon. And they were able to make a bifurcation diagram in the lab, okay? So what they did were to perform some experiments with yeast. So yeast um, is a unicellular organism that degrades the nutrients outside in the medium. And then after this degradation, the cells can uptake the food and grow and reproduce. So here we have a clear nonlinear process since the most, the more number of cells we have in, in the media, the more uh, processing of nutrients will be done and the best will be it for the growth of the population, okay? So here you can see uh, these, um, uh, blue circles that are the experimental results. And here what they did was to use the a dilution factor as a kind of control parameter that in some sense is like a death rate of the, of the population. So, but they were diluting the population, so de decreasing the population. So uh, you can see that, um, so this is population density of cells per microliter. So as the dilution rate, uh, dilution factor increases, the population has more or less similar stationary values, but at some point, the population is not able to sustain itself. And then you have extinction, okay? The, the, the solid line is the uh, result of a mathematical model that they did. And actually in a very clever and simple way, they were used, they were able to attract the unstable uh, fixed point by playing with initial conditions in the experiments. So as far as I know, this is the first evidence for the first bifurcation diagram that we have obtained from a biological system in a very clear and, and neat way, okay? Okay, so as I said, normal forms in ecology. So of course, ecosystems are extremely complex uh, systems with many interactions, but I would like to claim in the spirit of um, the Santa Fe Institute um, philosophy, and also the philosophy uh, of Ricard Sole, where I did my PhD, about the importance of simple models. Okay, simple models, phenology, phenomenological models, allow to tackle the main uh, interactions and sometimes gives us clues about things that are happening in higher dimensions on in higher parameter spaces. 
okay? So today I will talk about this equation that I have called like a normal form for a system in which we have self-cooperation. This is why we have the X square uh, term here and also competition, habitat destruction and decay. So here we are mainly considering uh, four processes. So we have the positive feedback in reproduction. This is in some sense that the most individuals that you have in the population that grow, the, grow, the, bet, the better and the faster will be the growth of the population. This is a logistic like term in which we have here, of course, interspecific competition. And here we have added this habitat destruction. Okay, then we have this density independent decay. Okay, so a base, uh, so uh, building up on this equation, I will, talk about three different um, projects. The first two are by are just considering D equal to zero. So we have no habitat destruction. And the second one will consider habitat destruction. So in the first one, I will talk about uh, something that has been present in many talks. And this is this kind of slowing down that we have just after the bifurcation. Just to say that this critical is slowing down uh, for some people that start working in this topic, mainly physicists, they talk about delayed transitions. Okay, but at the end is a mechanism of a slowing down, and this is what we know as ghosts. And the talking of Nuria and of Tomas uh, Lazaro, they they explain very well this phenomenon. Then I will switch to an extension of this uh, equation to a metapopulation frameworks, and we will see how change how can change things by taking into account metapopulations or space, okay? And then finally, I will switch to the uh, project of habitat destruction. Okay, so here um, I'm, I'm showing a lot of equations, but um, don't be scared because then I will I will show these uh, functions uh, in, in, in drawings. So this is the model. Um, this is autocatalysis. Uh, eta, well, is a carrying capacity that many times we set to one for simplicity. And this system obeys, I mean, just the function of reproduction and decay, not competition, to this uh, stoichiometry. So here we have autocatalysis. So two A's give place to three A's, and then we have degradation of A. And from this uh, one dimensional differential equation, we can compute the potential by just uh, integrating the, uh, the function, the, the ODE and we, we get this value, okay? And we have also computed the stochastic potential. Uh, so the stochastic potential has this complicated uh, expression, but if we show it uh, in a plot, this is for the deterministic case. So here mainly we have three different qualitative changes. Well, actually two qualitative different scenarios, but we have some in between this interesting example. So this is the potential when we are below the, the, the bifurcation value, okay? So here we are playing with uh, the degradation rate. So when we are here, we have two equilibrium points that in the potential graph, these are two wells, okay? So uh, these are attractors and we have the origin, okay? And the uh, equilibrium to which the population uh, is able to persist, okay? When we cross the bifurcation, um, this well, the well of, um, uh, survival disappears, and then we only have a single well. And this is where we switch from biostability to monostability. So the transition from this scenario to this one is through a sudden load bifurcation. And when, when we are very close to the bifurcation from above, what we see is the potential here is very flat. And it means that uh, the passage here is very, very, very slow. Okay, and this is what we call a ghost. So this plot has been shown many times. This is how the extinction time scales with the distance to the bifurcation, okay? And we have this uh, very uh, clear power law of exponent uh, minus uh, one half. And uh, this power law is, is uh, so this is a local phenomena. This, the delay is very, very long when we are very close to the, to the bifurcation. And this is the fingerprint that the ghost leaves in time series. I'm saying it because I, a lot of uh, people doing ecology work on time series and they do not have many much more dynamical information. And relating to the question yesterday that Sonia Kefi was doing to Bly, this is a way to distinguish if we have a ghost in a, in a time series. So what you will see, even if you have fluctuation, is that you have a very long bottleneck and then you have a very sharp drop of the population. Okay, 
So in this article in New Journal of Physics that we published last year, with Thomas Alarcón and Carlos Reich, what we did was, was to study what happens with this scaling and with the dynamics when we consider intrinsic noise that is a very important effect in uh, stochastic effect in populations. Okay? So uh, typically when you have noise and you have a bifurcation in the deterministic system, noise makes the bifurcation to, to move. Okay? So these are uh, different. So here you have in red the result of the deterministic system. In uh, and black dots, you have the mean population values of the LSP simulations of the system, okay? And this is um, for different system sizes. When the system size is small, uh, the transition takes place much below the bifurcation value predicted by the deterministic system. And as the system size increases, the deterministic, the stochastic system approaches to the deterministic system. So one first thing that we did, so the question was, was this, is this ghost robust to intrinsic fluctuations? So what we did is to compute the stochastic potential. And we already see that here, we could also uh, see that the potential, the stochastic potential becomes extremely flat just right after the uh, stochastic bifurcation, okay? So this is just uh, what we observed. So this is a table because uh, for the Gillespie simulations, we have to make a very fine, a very, a very um, uh, accurate com uh, computation of the stochastic uh, bifurcation value. So these are the typical time series that you see when you have a ghost. And what we see that if we compute the, the mean extinction times as a function of the distance of the stochastic bifurcation, the, as Thomas Lazaro explained, the power law is not phone at all. And we have this kind of this plateau and this small decrease. Okay? So this, this is some collapse of the curves that we did in this paper. So if you are interested, you can look to this article. Uh, okay, now I will switch to the metapopulation framework. So here, what we have is it's the same model. So this is the reaction equation in which we have the cross catalytic, the autocatalytic term. This is the logistic function. This is the decay. And what we did is just to include a term of passive diffusion. So we have two patches, patch, patch one and patch two, in which the population, the individual self uh, reproduce and catalyze themselves. And then we have some diffusion or migration. Okay? This is a kind of very simple diffusion model based on the fixed law. Okay. So here, what we see if we study the null clients of the system is that depending on, depending on diffusion and of course on the degradation rate of the system, the dynamics can be very, can change dramatically. So for small diffusion, we have nine equilibrium points. Here we have a pitchfork bifurcation and two sudden load bifurcations here. And at the end, what we have is that this typical scenario when we increase diffusion, that it means that we are approaching to the well-mixed, completely well-mixed system. We have this, this kind of origin stable, saddle and um, uh, an attractor, okay? So this is for the scenario of survival. What happens for the scenario of extinction? So we have that the bifurcation, this sudden load bifurcation has already taken place, okay? We have that the system is monostable and we also saw that the null clients were changing a little bit by increasing diffusion, okay? So here what we did was to analyze, mainly analyze the role of diffusion in this delaying capacities of the ghost and just to um, claim that uh, in this work, we were the first, uh, if I am not, uh, uh, I, 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 as far as I know, we were the first in proposing the saddle remnant as a new class of transient generator mechanisms for ecological systems, okay? Previous works, especially in physics, in uh, charge density waves, and in, uh, in other systems, were talking about these delayed transitions, but in the, um, field of biology or ecology, we were the first in proposing this as a, as a way of having non transients. Okay. Okay. And finally, uh, I will come back to the model with habitat destruction. So this is the normal form that we have to discuss. So, uh, yeah, here we have, uh, also the same scenario. So we have survival and, um, extinction. And now we will focus on the habitat loss. This is the parameter that goes from zero to one. 
as the bifurcation parameter. Okay? When, uh, so there is a threshold that is given by this critical bifurcation value that when the destruction of the habitat is higher than this value, then the population suffers a sudden bifurcation, just when D is equal to B sub C. Okay? So this is the, also the bifurcation diagram moving D, and this is the potential for different values of D. Okay, so, but what happens if we, and this model was used to model facilitation and habitat destruction, but what happens when we put space into the game? So here, what we did is to make a cellular automata in which we can have, let's say three different states of the automata. We can have an empty site, but uh, let's say fertile soil where species can go. Then we have occupied sites and we have sites with habitat destroyed. So if some plant, or let's say, this is, an, this is a simple model, we are not considering seed, seed dispersal, but if some plant or some seed goes to a destroyed site, nothing will happen, okay? So uh, what we do is we choose a randomly uh, cell, then we, we look for a random neighbor, and if there is uh, a, a plant or a new individual, then with some uh, uh, probability, uh, a, a new, uh, individual is played in any other side of the lattice. So here we implemented a function that allowed us to control how long can plants um, establish. Okay, so we have a way of tuning the system from a completely random uh, dispersal to a local dispersal. So these are the results for the random dispersal. Okay. And of course, here we do, we do not have any kind of spa, special self-organization. So this is just uh, a test that we need to see because this is like close to the Winfield model in which everything is mixed. So all the rules that we, are, we have in the automata uh, are completely random. So we are choosing neighbors at random in any lattice side. And, and this is like a, a, mil, a, a well mixed system. So this is the, the bifurcation diagram computed with the cellular automata. Uh, and here we can see that we have this sharp transition. Okay. Interestingly, when we are close to the transition, we even with this spatial model and a stochastic model, because this is a probabilistic cellular automata, we are able to see a ghost here, stochastic ghost with this very long plateau. Okay. So when we are far away the bifurcation, the ghost is not influencing the dynamics, and then we have a kind of exponential decay. So for a well-mixed like dynamics, we have a catastrophic transition. What happens if we restrict the interactions to the nearest neighborhood, neighborhoods? So surprise, we have a change from a catastrophic transition to a smooth one, okay? We have a pattern formation, okay? As we are approaching to this transition, we have a more dispersed um, distribution of, let's say, patches. So this is, for example, for the simulation for a value of habitat destruction of 0 0.3. We have different snapshots at different time points. Okay, And this is very close to the bifurcation. In principle, here we will not have extinction. And you see that this is uh, very dispersed. So um, there are some articles in which they discuss these changes in the transitions when you consider other effects, for example, space. But as far as I know, we do not understand why this is happening, why uh, this transition is changing. Actually, we don't know what kind of transition we have here. So if we think this system in, uh, in, in, in terms of, a, of bifurcation theory, I don't know if this is a pitch for bifurcation with the with other branch in the negatives. If this is a sudden node bifurcation that actually uh, the stable and unstable branches are, are colliding at zero. Although here I was look oh sorry I was doing some exploration and I did not find any signature of delayed transitions. Or if this is a transcritical bifurcation. So this is something that needs to be explored uh, using mathematical models to explain why we have this this change. Okay, this, you have all these results in, a population, in, the, in this article published in Population Ecology. So this is all I wanted to say, just to introduce uh, my, my lab that started kind of two years ago. 
So now I have two PhD students. One is Mark Plana that is going as, uh, to do a seminar in the research program, uh, Bly, who gave talk yesterday. And then uh, I am very lucky to, to have this uh, group of external members that are amazing scientists working in dynamical systems theory and uh, who are really open-minded person and are very interested in, in mathematical biology. Okay, so this is the, some funding that uh, was possible for making this research. And I also want to thank the Subterranean Kampfrank Laboratory. This is a, a particle physics laboratory, but sometimes we go there to, to work in, bio, in problems about biology. This is in the Pyrenees. And also to the Santa Fe Institute where I have been three or four times and I have some of the results that I have shown have been developed there. So thanks for your attention. Uh, here you have some Twitter accounts if you're interested uh, in uh, complex systems and nonlinear dynamics. And now it's time for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Josep. We are having 10 minutes delay, so it's not a big deal. I think we can have five minutes of questions. Uh, so Sonia, uh, I see your hand raising up. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. That was, was very interesting. I have a question which is probably a bit naive. Um, so in your first examples, when you talk about facilitation and positive interactions, you give example of both intraspecific and interspecific mechanisms. Uh, like the Ali effect is more intraspecific, and then you talk about facilitation, for example, among plants, which would yeah. be specific. But then your normal form is one di unidimensional, right? And so mm -hmm. my question is, how do you see... So if we think, so I understand very well how all of this applies if you're talking about a single population, but how mm -hmm. do you see the ability of deriving such generic normal form uh, for complex systems of multiple species that interact with each other in different ways? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, so of course we are um, so the idea uh, of the normal form is, is, is to have the, the minimum interactions that you might expect. And, uh, but also you, 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 can, you can think it in more dimensions because for example, in mathematics, we have, for example, a normal form for the Hopf bifurcation in, with two variables. We also have a full of, uh, amount of literature on um, co-dimension more than one co-dimension in bifurcation. So we have co-dimension to bifurcations with different uh, uh, evolution of the system taking um, different parameters. So for example, in terms of ecology, yeah, it, it could be, it could have a kind of normal form for a two species system, even considering, uh, you know, the, for example, the Lotka Volterra competition model could be a, a normal form for this kind of systems. Uh, this is an example. And, and as I was saying at the end, um, it is very important to, because, you know, these are very simple equations, but I have been working with the normal form that I, I have shown. I have been working with this equation for 15 years, and there are uh, many things that uh, we don't know, especially connecting dynamics with uh, uh, biological dynamics. And, um, well, this is very important because, for example, the example I was showing with the change in the transition when we take into account spatial uh, correlations and local correlations, uh, I am very curious to see if this is uh, how, how, how this uh, makes the saddle bifurcation to a change to another bifurcation that already we have, we have no, no idea of, of, of this transition. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was wondering whether you you have a system, a biological system, where you could explore this special component in mind or something like that, because that yeah. also could, could yeah. help you know, in this in this in this idea. Yeah, this is actually yeah, this is actually what Jose Marcadal was asking. So yeah, I think I think that it should be something in the spirit of kind of the two variable metapopulation model that I found. Because in some sense we need to take into account local correlations, but you know it's not. It's I think it's not easy to have a low-dimensional system to to explore this. Perhaps there are other options with other mathematical approaches or even computational approaches, simpler ones, 
or even, I don't know. So we have one thing that one could exploit, and actually I was doing some tests, is to try to find signatures of the bifurcations that we already know in the simulations with the space, for example, these delayed transitions, these bottlenecks, or um, I mean, instead of thinking in a mathematical model, capturing these uh, local interactions in doing time series analysis close to the stochastic transition to these continuous transitions and look for signatures that we already know that happened for other, other bifurcations. For example, uh, we know that for second order phase transitions, uh, fluctuations uh, have kind of scale-free properties. We know these uh, early warning signals that Sonia has a lot of expertise in this. So yeah, perhaps we can, we can discuss it uh, in some yeah, way, exactly. but it's something that it's not understood very well. So this is uh, a bit related to Josep Mercadal questions here in the chat. Yeah. Uh, and also we have a question by Javier and, and David wanted to ask you something. So Javier yeah. is asking whether, you know, how is the Gauss behavior, if any, when your habitat landscape is not well mixed? Okay, yeah. So this is, this is, a, this is a very good question. Uh, so actually we are, we are doing some research now on um, with uh, Silvia Cuadrado and Angel Calzina, we are trying to see how this delay phenomena is changing when you consider, um, well, here it would be a kind of well mixed, but would be a kind of special model, continuous special model with uh, PDEs. Okay, so even we are working with a very simple equation like the one I was showing, but you know, when you have PDEs, the dimension of the dynamical system is, is infinite. And yeah, so we know a lot, we have worked a lot in the deterministic approach. We know this is scaling low. Actually, this is scaling low is in some sense quite independent of dimension because this is something that is happening around uh, equilibrium point. But as I said, there is few research in uh, stochastic systems and in, in when you do not have a well-mixed system, okay? Because even the cellular automata I was showing uh, with local correlations was losing these Mm, let's say catastrophic shift and in principle was losing the ghost state but you know this is a very simple model it's, it's just if you have a neighbor like you you will reproduce this is the a plus a gives three a's this is a non-linearity but of course when we go to to landscape ecology or we have habitat fragmentation this is a much more complicated system and here there is a huge research line that ecologists we should try to to follow and include more um complex dynamics there. So the, David is also asking, uh, David Alonso is asking, uh, you know, how, that, how does this ghost relate to the, to the famous extinction debt concept? I mean, is, is there any relationship? Mm, yeah, well, since this ghost is causing uh, uh, really, really uh, long delays and, and, and actually as uh, Nuria said in her talk, this effect exists in, in reality. So uh, it was found in an electronic circuit, I mean, in the experiments. Um, I think that possibly this, although it's a local phenomenon, so you, you, you need to be very close to the bifurcation, perhaps it could help uh, delaying these, uh, these extinctions. And, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps as, as Bly was explaining his talk, uh, I think a very interesting concept that is, has not been explored uh, to date, uh, if I'm not wrong, is this coupling of uh, delaying attractors. So you can have, so this is a simple model, we only have a sudden bifurcation, but perhaps we have uh, two different types of bifurcation that are, clo are close in the parameter space. And, and, but here we have to look to the phase space. So imagine that you have a ghost and then you have a, a ghost orbit, then you can enter into the ghost uh, for a very long time, and then you can move to the ghost orbit and stay there. And if you have noise, which is something that has not been already explored in this in this uh, scaling low and delay phenomena in, in a very very thoroughly, then uh, perhaps you can have some kind of resonances or or something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for the future. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of things that we already don't know. So if, if the audience has any other question else, we can, 
we can finish here the morning session and uh, we are going to be finding each other at three sharp uh, for for the next uh, talk by by Simon Levin and and now it's time for lunch okay okay thank you so see you all uh, at three we're going to be you, here everybody have bye a bye. nice lunch bye bye bye